it for the future. And that's why the government's new modern industrial strategy will take that even further. A strategy that promises to be outward looking and international from the start, drawing on the best of what has been achieved globally. It will build on the UK's strengths to support even more international businesses to thrive in our market. To do this, we are guided by four key principles. Building long-term stability, renewing our commitment to free and fair trade, cutting costs for investors, and working in partnership with business and trade unions. Our industrial strategy will create long-term, sustainable, inclusive and secure growth, injecting capital into eight high productivity, high export, high investment sectors, those in which the UK already claims a significant competitive advantage. Those sectors are financial services, professional and business services, clean energy industries, digital and tech, advanced manufacturing, life sciences, creative industries and defence. Above all else though, our industrial strategy will show that we are listening and responding to the needs of business. To that end, it will engage on those more complex issues you've highlighted to us as barriers to investment, skills, data, <clears throat> finance, regulation, energy prices, grid connections, infrastructure and planning. And we'll view every single one of these through the lens of investment promotion, ensuring that our policies are made with business and for business. We want to work with mayors and multinationals, councils and CEOs, devolved administrations and academics to deliver that prosperity through partnership. And you can see that here at this summit in our announcement of the expanded Office for Investment. It will become the UK's full investment promotion body with powerful tripartite sponsorship from the Prime Minister, the Chancellor and myself. It will be led by our new Minister for Investment, Poppy Gustafsson, a titan of the tech world who comes into government with a wealth of private sector experience, not least in co-founding Darktrace and turning it into a multi-billion pound company. And I know she will expertly guide the Office for Investment in providing a seamless journey for our most strategically important international and domestic investors, helping them navigate government and unlock capital. And this offer to investors will include new triage services to support them with planning and skills issues. This will be a partnership with expert planners and skills specialists in the Ministry of Housing and the Department for Education, providing bespoke practical support to tear down those barriers to investment. The Office for Investment will also work hand in hand with central and local government to turn the industrial strategy and regional growth plans into a clear, commercially attractive pipeline of investment opportunities. We want to pilot a new way of supporting transformational local projects. We want to connect them with specialist support to develop exciting opportunities at the right scale and the right commercial credibility to pull in large-scale investment. Together, these changes will help supercharge investment into our cities and regions, whether that's digital industries in Belfast, life sciences in Cambridge and Liverpool, advanced manufacturing in Wales and Greater Manchester, or financial services in Edinburgh, Leeds, or right here in London, where we want our capital to retain its crown as the top financial centre ahead of New York, Paris and Singapore. Yesterday, we announced a new Industrial Strategy Advisory Council to help spearhead this work, and I am delighted to say it will be led by Claire Barclay. As the trailblazing CEO of Microsoft UK, Claire is perfectly placed to lead the Council's work in bringing leaders together right across business, academia and the trade union movement to drive forward the strategy's implementation. Part of that work is ensuring that our growth-spurring sectors can fully benefit from our upcoming trade strategy, where we're forging a closer relationship with the EU. We want smoother trade and simpler processes for doing business, but we're also seeking new growth-spurring trade deals with powerhouse economies across the globe, including the Gulf Cooperation Council and India. Crucially, the delivery of our industrial strategy is not limited to one or two departments. It is a complete cross-government effort. And it's why our new National Wealth Fund is turbocharging investment in the, into the green technologies of the future. And you'll be hearing more from the Chancellor today about the next big steps we're taking to ensure the National Wealth Fund benefits businesses and communities in every part of the country. It's complemented by the work of the Department for Energy Security and Net Zero, 
They are ensuring that businesses are the ones leading Britain's charge to becoming a clean energy superpower by 2030. It's also why the Ministry of Housing is overhauling our planning system so that international investment flows into building the next generation of UK infrastructure alongside 1.5 million new homes. Over the course of today, hopefully you'll have the chance to meet some of the Cabinet Ministers delivering on the missions I've spoken about. They are personally delivering the era of change, of stability and certainty that this new government brings. Quite simply, my friends, the days of the UK constantly shifting policies and priorities are over. We are here and committed to the long term. So we really do believe we have a world-beating offer for those who make the UK their investment destination of choice. I hope that resonates in the plenary sessions, the networking events, and the keynote speeches we have planned for you today. I hope you will leave this summit inspired by what you've heard, confident that here in the UK, we have a government that wants you to be at the forefront of our new pro-innovation, pro-business, pro-wealth creation economy. And we want you to share in its success. And now, it is my great pleasure to welcome my friend, the Prime Minister, Sir Keir Starmer. Thank you, Johnny, and thanks to all of you for being here. It's fantastic to stand here and to look out and see so many of you here, and I'm really grateful that you've made the effort and you are here. It means a huge amount uh, to me and my government. Um, and welcome to this, this government's first international investment summit. And some of you, I know, have come a very long way to be here. You've flown in a great distance. Some of you will be going straight back out again afterwards. You've made a huge effort to share with us the precious gift of your time. And we're really, really grateful for that. And welcome to the Guild Hall, London's ancient town hall. Isn't it a fantastic building? It's really breathtaking, um, this Guild Hall. Not, of course to be confused with the nearby Guildhall School of Music, where I once pursued a fleeting ambition to play the flute professionally. <laughs> I kid you not. Complete with then long hair and very, very flared jeans. All photographic evidence has been destroyed, I'm afraid. <laughs> but today we're pursuing a different ambition, a shared ambition, growth. You have to grow your business, and I have to grow my country. I'll leave it to you to decide if you think voters or shareholders are the more forgiving audience. But without growth, let's just agree, it's a difficult conversation, whoever you're talking to. And that therefore growth is the cause that binds us together, the shared endeavour of prosperity. It's why we've made it the number one test of this government. And I'm determined to do everything in my power to galvanise growth. Determined for this country to be the highest growing economy in the G7. That is our most important national mission. Because it's the only way to deliver the mandate for change that we've won. Growth is higher wages. Growth is a more vibrant high street. Growth is public services back on their feet. It's less poverty, more opportunity, more meals out, more holidays, more precious moments with your family, more cash in your pocket. And of course, for any business, it means a bigger market, higher demand, a more secure and prosperous future. Your effort and enterprise rewarded in profit. But it is much more important even than all that we live in an age when political fires rage across the world. Conflict, insecurity, a populist mood that rails against the open values so many of us hold dear. Values which, as you know, are so crucial for making business easy to do. 
And yet at the same time, look around the world. Look at the investments you and others are making. This is an age of great possibility as well. Huge revolutions in digital technology, in clean energy, medicine, life sciences, each with the potential to fundamentally change the way we live and the way that we work. Each with the possibility to transform the lives of working people for the better. And so, in times like this, economic growth is vital, as it's always been, if we're to steer our way through a great period of insecurity and change and on to calmer waters. Because when working people benefit from that growth, when every community enjoys the fruits of wealth creation, it stops a country turning in on itself and against the world. And that, in turn, helps provide a stable foundation, breathing space, for a country to take advantage of those opportunities for a better future. Uh, to put it more simply, it's not just that stability leads to growth, though we all recognize that. It's also that growth leads to stability. Growth leads to a country that's better equipped to come together and get its future back. And that's why it's always been so critical to my political project. The key ingredient of that great moderation we became accustomed to before the financial crash, but which together, in partnership, we now have to earn again. Every one of you here today has been invited for that reason. It's not just that you lead some of the most important businesses in the world. It's also because you're pivotal to this great cause of our times. And the reason we are focusing so much on investment is because the mission of growth, in this country in particular, demands it. Private sector investment is the way we rebuild our country and pay our way in the world. And make no mistake, this is a great moment to back Britain. This is a great moment back England, Scotland, Northern Ireland and Wales. We have an amazing education system that produces some of the best talent in the world, the largest tech sector in Europe, leading positions in some of those great industries of the future, artificial intelligence, life sciences, clean energy, the creative industries. We're a country where businesses thrive, small and large alike clear regulatory frameworks and protection, a legal system that sets high standards around the globe, a location that means we can speak to our colleagues in the Americas or Asia in the same day, a high ranking in the Global Innovation Index every year, our wonderful global language, our world-renowned sport and culture, this great modern city all around us, a heritage steeped in commerce and trade, a set of shared values, centuries long, of being a country that is open for business. You can't put a price on any of this. Now, we've got our problems, of course we have. As I've said, our public services need urgent care. Our public finances need the tough love of prudence. Challenges we cannot ignore, because we know, just as every leader here knows, that those early weeks and months are precious. And no matter how many people advise you to ignore it, that you must run towards the fire to put it out, not let it spread further. So we will fix our public services. We will stabilize our economy, and we will do it quickly because we don't want any of the problems associated with our inheritance. Misting up the shop window of Britain, distracting you from all those assets that I just listed. Assets that may feel more intangible, but are more valuable, more enduring, and deeper in the bones of this nation, and which are ready to be unlocked 
if we take firm and decisive action on policy, which we can and we will, and to give you total confidence that this is the moment to back Britain. Now, let me quickly run through four crucial areas in our pitch for Britain. And I, I know it's kind of CEO heresy to have a list of four, not three. So I apologize. <laughs> Please indulge me. First, stability. We have a golden opportunity to use our mandate, to end the culture of chop and change, the policy churn, the sticking plaster politics that makes it so hard for investors to assess the value of any proposition. Now, you may think, well, every government says that. But the stability that comes with a large majority in our system, that is a unique advantage. And we have the determination, the focus on clear long-term ends, a mission-led mindset that thinks in years, not the days or hours of the news grid, needed to unlock the potential. And don't doubt that. Second strategy, we're building a more strategic architecture for growth, a way for investors to have a much steadier hand on the tiller. That's why we've announced a new national wealth fund and switched on great British energy, which will accelerate investment in clean power and future technologies, like carbon capture and storage, for example which we backed alongside BP, Equinor, and Eni, and which shows the hard-headed approach we will take to industrial policy, a partnership sharing the risk with the private sector, ambition, absolutely, but also <laughs> unsentimental, guided by the market, focused at all times on the real potential for comparative advantage in this country. You know, this is the point I would always make about our modern industrial strategy. Uh, in this country, there's been a long, rather arcane political debate about picking winners. Well, we're not in the business of picking individual winners but we are in the business of building on our strengths, mowing the grass on the pitch, making sure the changing rooms are clear and comfortable, the training ground is good, so that when our businesses compete, they're match fit. That, to put it simply, we give the businesses of this country the best conditions to succeed. And I don't know why that's sometimes controversial in this country. Industrial policy seems fairly commonplace elsewhere in the world, but it is fundamental to the way we see our job on growth and our relationship with a room like this. Third, Britain's global standing. We're determined to improve it, determined to repair Britain's brand as an open, outward-looking, confident, trading nation. But I see this as diplomatic necessity. And I think it's clear how much priority I've given it in the first hundred days of government, all around the world, whether it's countries or investors. People want to know that Britain can be a stable, trusted, rule-abiding partner, as we've always been that somehow during the whole circus that followed Brexit, the last government made a few people less sure about, needlessly insulting our closest allies. And of course, a few choice Anglo-Saxon phrases for business. Well, no more. We've turned the page on that decisively, and we will use that reset for growth. Finally, fourth, regulation. Now, I don't see regulation as good or bad. That seems simplistic to me. Some regulation is life-saving. We saw that in recent weeks here 
with the report on the tragedy of Grenfell Tower. But across our public sector, I would say the previous government hid behind regulators, deferred decisions to them because it was either too weak or indecisive, or simply not committed enough to growth. Now, planning is a very real example of that. Or, for friends from across the pond, permitting is a really clear example of that, the global language. But anyway, the key test for me on regulation is, of course, growth. Is this going to make our economy more dynamic? Is this going to inhibit or unlock investment? Is it something that enables the builders, not the blockers? Now, I know some people may be wondering about our labour market policies introduced last week. Let me be clear. They're pro-growth. Workers with more security at work, with higher wages, that is a better growth model for this country. It will lead to a more dynamism in our labour market. And seriously, we need to think differently about this. A nation's position in the world is changing all the time, as must its growth model. So while I know that this is a room full of businesses who take investing in their human capital seriously, when I look at the British economy as a whole, it does seem as though it's sometimes we're more comfortable hiring people to work in low pay, insecure contracts, than we are in investing in the new technology that delivers for workers, for productivity, and for our country. And we've got to break out of that trap. But we've also got to look at regulation across the piece and where it is needlessly holding back the investment we need to take our country forward. Where it's stopping us building the homes, the data centres, the warehouses, grid connectors, roads, train lines, you name it. Then mark my words, we will get rid of it. Take the East Anglia 2 wind farm. Now this is a £4 billion investment. One gigawatt of clean energy. An important project, absolutely. But also the sort of thing a country as committed to clean energy as we are needs to replicate again and again. Now regulators demanded over 4,000 planning documents for that project. Not 4,000 pages, 4,000 documents. And then, six weeks after finally receiving planning consent, it was held up for a further two years by judicial review. I mean, as an investor, when you see that kind of inertia, you don't bother, do you? And that, in a nutshell, is the biggest supply-side problem we have in this country. So it's time to upgrade the regulatory regime, make it fit for the modern age, harness every opportunity available to Britain. We will rip up the bureaucracy that blocks investment. We will march through the institutions and make sure that every regulator in this country, especially our economic and competition regulators, take growth as seriously as this room does. And look, tell us about your frustrations on this. Speak to my team. Speak to me, to Rachel, to Johnny, to Ed, and our new Minister for Investment, Poppy. Any leader knows the importance of a good team, and we've got one here. We're united behind growth. Our door is open, and the work of change has already begun. We're reforming the planning system. The onshore wind ban has gone. New projects in solar, wind, tidal energy, carbon capture and storage, tax relief for the creative industries, investment from the world's leading companies, Blackstone, Amazon, a new partnership with Cyrus One to build data centers in Didcot, finally grasping the nettle on airport expansion, a new £1 billion commitment from Manchester Airport Group to expand Stansted, opening up new routes for work and holiday destinations. 
the first of tens of billions worth of inward investment deals that we will sign today because we're determined to lead the way on growth, determined to get Britain building, determined to get our economy moving through the shock and awe of investment. That's the message to take home today when the big decisions are made. When you go back to your boardrooms and ask, where does our money go? Where do our jobs go? Where does our investment go for a better future? Let me offer you a new answer. It's time to back Britain. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Stability, industrial strategy, global standing as open and outward looking, regulation and a new Minister for Investment. Lots of things to be excited about. So we will be calling on you again, Prime Minister, in a moment as the Prime Minister will be sitting down to share a conversation with Eric Schmidt, former CEO of Google moderated by Dame Emma Wormsley, CEO at GSK. Hence the furniture moving. I must first congratulate Eric Schmidt on this summer's honorary knighthood. Congratulations, Eric. As many of you will know, Eric Schmidt is an accomplished technologist, entrepreneur, and philanthropist who is also known for his pivotal role in the growth of Google as its CEO from 2001 to 2011, overseeing its transformation from a small startup to a giant global tech company. What a journey. Most recently in 2024, in partnership with his wife, Wendy, Eric co-founded Schmidt Sciences, a nonprofit working to advance science and technology in deepening human understanding of the natural world whilst developing solutions to global issues. And his latest of many books, Genius, Genesis, forgive me, Genesis, Artificial Intelligence, Hope, and the Human Spirit, was co-written with academic Craig Mundy and the late Dr. Henry Kissinger. Our moderator, Dame Emma Wormsley, has headed up GSK, the world's largest vaccine company, since 2017. She has been quite busy over the last few years. GSK has 11,000 employees in the UK and its global HQ sits right here in London. And so in the company of the Prime Minister, we now have the opportunity to hear from leaders from very different fields about a range of topics from AI to healthcare to investment. Ladies and gentlemen, your panel. Good morning, everybody. We are here to talk about growth and specifically your long-term execution plans to make sure we deliver it together so that everyone here doesn't just back Britain, but bets big on Britain. And I want to start, Prime Minister, with a question of our competitiveness. You've been crystal clear it's all about growth, and that is something that you want to lead in partnership with business. But every investor in this room has choices. It's about our relative competitiveness. So how versus other G7 countries or the rest of Europe and the, and the region, uh, are we going to make sure that the costs of doing business in Britain are competitive, that the regulatory environment and the changes you're going to drive are going to be competitive? And perhaps most importantly, if we can just all look beyond the immediate budget cycle focus uh, and take a long-term view. By the, 
During your watch, what do you most want to have achieved in reform for business to make Britain worth this bet? Well, thank you for that. I think it's a really important opening place. There are a number of components that I think are important uh, and you can almost sort of work down through them. Um, the first is to be clear with everybody in this room and beyond that this is a government that is mission-driven, that has a driving sense of purpose and that the number one mission is economic growth. And everything else uh, ladders up to that. So this real clarity, I think one of the biggest mistakes of governments, particularly recent governments, here has been too much focus on the short term, too much chop and change, too much what I've called sticking plaster politics. So you've got a government with strategic long-term vision, which is around a very clearly defined mission. And that helps with certainty, strategic thinking, but it also helps with priority, because all governments have to prioritise. Difficult decisions are made all of the time. And this gives us um, a yardstick, if you like, which is, is it pro-growth, in which case yes, or is it not pro-growth, in which case no. The second thing then, with the, alongside the mission but crucial to it, is um, that we've got a good majority under our political system. And that's not about political bragging um, and the numbers. Um, it's not particularly party political, but it is to say the decisions that we can make are therefore measured in years, not months. And for investors, that's really important. Now, that's the sort of high-level um, issue. So it's growth, it's mission-driven, it's got the stability that we need. But what I also want to make clear today is that we have um, listened good and hard to execution questions, the point you put to me. That's all very well, but how does that actually materially make a difference to me as an investor? Because as you rightly say, uh, we've got choices to make. We could invest here, we could invest somewhere else. So how do you change the environment? Now, on the positive column, if you like, we've got brilliant assets, brilliant education, brilliant skills, some of the best universities in the world, um, and real leaders, you know, artificial intelligence, you know, life sciences, you name it. There's all of the assets I just listed in my speech, really strong attributes of the UK. But in the other column, we've got some inhibitors. <laughs> Uh, and it's those that we need, to, well, we need to absolutely champion um, the, the brilliance that we've got to offer, but we need to get rid of some of the inhibitors. And um, most of my determination to get rid of the inhibitors has been through conversations with people uh, in this room around planning. It takes far too long to get decisions on planning, far too long, measured in years, not months. Um, and so we've got to streamline that, and that's what we've already started on um, on regulation, again, what I was trying to say in my speech is, I'm not, as it were, saying all regulation is bad, but the sheer volume that we've got here and the inconsistency with different regulators or bodies pulling in slightly different directions means it's not just the volume of regulation, it's also the fact that there's not even a, a sort of clear landing path in, uh, for investment. That is what we need to strip away. There are other things as well, the grid, the infrastructure, etc. And we've set up some of the mechanisms now uh, for doing that. Huge, uh, you know, we've got uh, investment um, minister, we've got um, a real focus on innovation, the National Wealth Fund, Great British Energy. But it is, uh, it, it's doing the both together. But the one thing that having a good majority gives you is the opportunity for bold action very early on in a parliamentary term to do the things which have always been put in the too difficult box. I mean, everybody knows plan planning's a problem. We've known this. Anybody who's ever been involved in investment infrastructure projects will know planning is a problem. But until now, you've had a mindset in politics which is, that, well, let's put that in a difficult box because it, it raises too many issues. Everyone knows that regulation actually needs to be streamlined um, and made fit for purpose. Um, but again, too dangerous to to deal with, let's put it in the too difficult box. I think now's the time to absolutely grasp these things, to create the environment for investors to invest. And the, the final thing I'd say is this, this has to be a partnership between a, a mission-driven government on the one hand and the private sector on the other. But what's important in a partnership is that both partners don't try and do the same thing. Mm. Um, that government doesn't try to do what investors in the private sector does because investors in the private sector do it better. Um, 
but equally that uh, we are setting the mission, what we want to achieve, so investors need to know I'm happy with the end destination, and then what the government's role is to make sure that the path is cleared uh, for that to succeed, and therefore there's different bits of the partnership um, that if they're done well as a true partnership, I think create condition, I think there's a real window of opportunity here um, in 2024 for this to happen, um, and we have to seize it. So Eric, as an, as an investor yourself, when you listen to that list from the Prime Minister, what do you think is most important to keep the UK competitive? What's missing? And what do you think is the risk to us to delivering this successfully for the country? Um, I was shocked when Labour became strongly in favour of growth. <laughs> um, Wealth creation is the number one mission of a Labour government. <laughs> did you hear that? Yeah. Um, it's true. And, and I actually know you well enough to know you actually believe this. So when I look at this, I say to myself, how will you pull it off? In, in the time I've spent with this group um, in the last few days, there's plenty of money that's going to come into the country if you achieve what you just said. So when I listen to this, I think maybe instead of calling it regulation and investment, you should call it a lot of investment and very small amount of regulation. It, or maybe you need a, yeah. a, a minister of anti-regulation. <laughs> uh, a, a more serious proposal is that de democracies, especially something as long as, as old as this one, have so many ways in which people can say no. I'd much rather, and I think the business community would much rather have a single person who can say yes or no, and who says no, and then they can move on. The cost of capital and the delay is killing you. Yeah. And furthermore, you're not going to achieve your 2030 energy goal, which is laudable, without fixing this. So yeah. you have a tactical leadership problem to achieve this, and I think you can pull it off. But you have to figure out a way to get control. You have a strong political capital right now. You just started. You're forming your government. You've got to find a way to get them to move on this agenda as opposed to just go like this. Yeah. That means I'm listening, not that I'm doing it. No, I think this is a really big challenge. It has to be a, a cross-government um, priority, not just within the Treasury team. It's got to be a cross-government. And one of the things we've done is to create mission delivery boards, which doesn't sound like a very interesting concept, but is, <laughs> but is vital. If you're going to do this, you've got to do it horizontally across all different departments at the same and time. And get those silos So out. we are setting up some of the structures that will do this. But in the end, it's a mindset. It's a mindset of does this promote growth or does it not promote growth uh, being the most important question we ask ourselves. So can I um, come to the question of where we sit in the global yeah. uh, context, one of the things I often hear is that people like investing in Britain because it can be a source of innovation for the world. We have a great track record of doing that. Another one is because we can be a hub and a bridge internationally. So it's not just about the domestic market. But in a post-Brexit world, how does that actually work? And again, what is the competitive offer for that international connectivity? I think this is a really important point because I think the international reset or the reset on the international stage has to come alongside what we're doing on investment. Um, what, you know, whichever way people campaigned and voted on Brexit, um, one of the consequences to my mind was that the impression was given that the UK was more interested in sort of turning in on itself, becoming more isolated um, and less interested, frankly, in um, the outside world than we once were. We've always been a champion of the outside world, always been looked to for influence, a sort of, a sort of pragmatic problem-solving country that very often um, was able to take a lead because of those key qualities. And that, that, as I say, this actually isn't an argument about which way we voted or not, but the impression became that there was a lot of chaos after Brexit because actually nobody quite knew where we were going next. And it looked as though we were sort of looking at ourselves. By resetting internationally, which is what I've spent a lot of capital on in the, in the first 101 or two days, um, we can be clear again that we want to play the role we used to play um, uh, uh, on the international stage, confident, outward-looking, uh, values-driven, uh, abiding by agreements that we make, 
uh, that matters, and we've got real attributes to go with it. Bridging um, to partners, whether in Europe or elsewhere across the world, which we can do, um, and that's why I've spent quite a lot of time trying to rebuild those particular relationships. <coughs> but also clear, that I won't go through everything in the speech that I had in terms of our language, our timelines, yeah. the, and the rule of law, which is hugely important to every investor. Um, if people are going to invest in the UK, when they can invest in other countries, um, they need to know, as they do know with our um, legal system, um, that they can be confident that should there become a point of dispute, it will be resolved um, properly quickly and with the highest sort of calibre of judges or adjudicators. And all of that matters on the international scene. So, Eric, as an investor, uh, and I know a, a commentator on geopolitics writ large, uh, is there anything else about the UK's relationship with the US in a post-election environment or indeed with China that you, impact, you think impacts people's thoughts about how to invest here. And again, when you look on the global stage, are there are any particular fields or industries where you think the UK is particularly well suited to lead? On, on the second part of your question, the Prime Minister outlined exactly where the leadership is. And it's profound. We can talk about that when we talk about AI. There are many, many reasons to think that you have all of the elements to achieve your, your vision in the country. Um, on this question of, of West versus China, um, the fact of the matter is you're going to become closer to the U.S. and the U.S. is going to become closer than you. We already have this incredible national security um, uh, collaboration, which is crucial to national security for the, na for the world and certainly for the United States. Um, but the other thing that's happening is that you have much more integration between the universities, research labs, and so forth. Yeah. And people are going back and forth. So one way to think about it is your future is your former colony, the, U the U.S., and maybe Canada and a few others, right, certainly India, um, rather than China. And I think when people get confused, right, they don't understand how the geopolitics are really going to work. The kind of sort of openness and democratic processes that we'd hope for in China are not going to occur. It's a different system, different strengths, different weaknesses. It's not an enemy, it's a competitor, and it's a tough competitor. C together, the US and the UK should be able to out-innovate and outrun this incredible innovation engine in China if we do it well, and if we, we do everything that you just talked about. And I think on innovation, on technology, on things like well, artificial intelligence, we've got a real chance uh, on this if we take the chance now. So let, let's talk about AI. <clears throat> Eric, you, you know, again, uh, you've commented often and a deep expert in its security threats, but also its innovation opportunities. And I know you're writing now on a very hopeful vision for AI as a, as a partner for human ambition. We absolutely know we need guardrails and we need the right kind of international frameworks and regulation here. We know that all businesses are working hard to work out how to drive adoption, not just for productivity, but also for growth. And it would be great to hear from both of you, perhaps Eric, you first, and then the Prime Minister, on your hopeful vision for AI as a growth enabler, driving economic prosperity, and particularly why this country is the place to bet on this uh, capability. Where is it going to be game changing well, growth? If, Where is it going? If you go to the Science Museum down the road, you'll understand that the industrial age was invented right here. And there's every reason to think that artificial intelligence will have the same level of impact. And by the way, it was invented right here too, in particular in King's Cross, which I think is your district. My constituency, yeah. So, <laughs> good job. Uh, and, again. and Demis getting the, um, uh, the, the no prize, prize. Nobel, yeah, Nobel I mean, prize. That's absolutely amazing. After, four years after inventing, inventing uh, something which changed, uh, has changed. But the fact of getting it in such a short period of time is, I mean, as I said to him yesterday, I feel proud. He should. <laughs> Nobel prizes and Oscars is another place this country bets above yes. its weight. So. The yeah. creative industries are very strong. So, so one, way to, one way to think about it is that you're actually beginning something which will go on for 50 or 100 years that will change society in really profound ways. And my answer, uh, which is the hopeful answer, is that we will work with this alien intelligence, not to scare you, um, <laughs> and that that intelligence makes us smarter and more effective as humans and that the world becomes more efficient. I can't prove it, but my opinion is each and every one of us will become 
at least twice as productive. Frankly, you can give twice as many speeches, you can have twice as many laws. Don't show the audience so uh, you, 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 can invent, you can invent incredible life-saving drugs at twice the speed. Of I, can, I, you know, I can make stuff up at twice the speed, whatever. <laughs> but, the, but the key thing here is that this, you, you, people who worry about our AI don't understand that it's fundamentally in search of efficiency gains. It's optimized around efficiency, at least in its current form. What's interesting about Britain is in addition to being the progenitor of all of the diaspora of all the people who are now being funded with enormous amounts of money without any product, revenue, or hope is a difference, right? But nevertheless, all of that has occurred as a starting point from here. And the consequence of all of that is an enormous wave of investment that will benefit each and every industry by making it more efficient, more successful. What happens to humans? Their incomes go up, not down in this scenario. That's the important point. The UK, a year ago, established the, the core structure of AI safety and security. And this is an example where the, the UK system, the British system, has frankly stronger civil servants who are smarter and are more committed to this and who are frankly stable. Um, and as a result, you can sort of work with them. So I think there's every reason that the UK can, can not only help innovate and build this, but can also help deal with the guardrail issues. Yeah. And the re there's a reason why we started in the UK first. Prime Minister, anything you want to add on ambitions for AI here? Well, I mean, what Eric said is hugely um, motivating and inspiring a sense of what this is capable of uh, achieving and changing. I, I, I almost said in our lifetime, but actually over the next five to ten years is going to be incredible change. I think one of the most important things for a government is the posture. Are we leaning in and seeing this as an opportunity, as I do, or are we sort of leaning out saying this is rather scary, we're better regulated, which I think uh, will be the wrong approach. Obviously, it, there's, there's always a question of balance, but what's your primary posture really matters on AI. It is a game changer um, that has massive potential on productivity um, and on driving our economy, um, and we need to run towards it. Um, one of the fields, and I am obviously biased, but um, seeing Wes uh, in the second row, um, is that it's going to change everything, in, is healthcare, which is a great driver of economic prosperity. We know you want to bet really big on life sciences. This country has world-beating data sets with the Biobank, with our future health, and we know we're going to unlock safely and in a trustworthy way the data from the NHS as well. But how are you going to set up the right environment to give all the innovators and the growth drivers the chance to harness this data? And now it would be good to then hear from you on, in public services more broadly, how we build that trust factor. I think let's start with health because it's so important. Um, we are rightly proud of the fact that we have a national health service set up by the post-war Labour government and every year we sort of uh, add a year to our pride in what we set up 70 plus years ago. But the simple truth is now that if all we do is put more money into the health system, the health service as it is, um, we won't properly improve it. Um, because the demands are too great, we will be forever putting in extra money, uh, we'll probably run it a bit better, but we won't make it really fit for the future. So the only way to make it fit for the future is to reform it and to reimagine it. And that's where AI and tech are so important to this project, because through AI and tech we can reimagine the health service. Um, it is I mean, I've seen small examples of... Um, AI in our health service where it's being used, um, you know, scanning for cancer, particularly liver was an example that I saw for myself with, you know, massively increased chances of getting um, cancer earlier. But there's much, much more that can be done um, in relation to that. So this is something that we need to use in health and we need to think differently in health. I'm not talking about changing the basic principles at free at the point of need and all the rest of it. I'm talking about a different health um, service that in, in 70 plus years people can look back at the 2024 Labour government with as much pride as we do at the government in the post-war era. But not just health, I think all public services need reform um, and technology, AI are part of that um, reform. Huge potential I think for AI to be a game changer when it comes to the delivery of public services. I'll just say one more thing because I think it's important. Um, having worked as a civil servant for five years in criminal justice, 
there's always an inhibition in government when it comes to technology and change, um, a sort of real fear of change. And we, we need um, to make sure the culture and mindset is changed as well, because otherwise we, we will know it's a good thing and it will probably make a big difference, but we'll be a bit too inhibited from reaching for it in case um, you know, somebody is held responsible for something that doesn't go as well as everybody expects. We have to change that culture because otherwise uh, we risk that technology AI is sort of developing all around us and yet we haven't made it central to government. There's a real opportunity here, a real opportunity. Now, if productivity goes up and goes twice, um, then imagine what that would do for our public services. Imagine what that will do for our economy. Obviously, we have to bring people with us. It means that people will be doing different and better jobs, not no jobs, um, but it will really change our ability to, to take this country forward um, at some considerable speed. The, the UK Biobank is an incredible, Extraordinary. incredible gift yeah. to the world. Because remember that these AI algorithms need training data, and you need to amass a lot of it, right? And so the decisions that you all made to do that and to continue it are crucial. You mentioned cancer. Um, computer vision, I'm sorry to say, is better than human vision now. And it's much more accurate, for example, in the scoring of the various size and types yeah. of cancers through imaging. That's another improvement. The average, uh, in this case, patient doesn't know but it makes the doctor more productive, more accurate, fewer errors, and so forth. Done right, these technologies can make government services more targeted, yeah. fewer errors, and more efficient. If you add that at the scale that your country is at, the savings are massive. I mean, they, so we believe it's going to completely transform drug discovery. And, yeah. you know, in the end, finding more solutions that keep people out of hospital and get back to community care is also going to be absolutely fundamental. Last question from me, energy. So, you know, this is another major mission for you, Prime Minister, net zero, clean energy. And there are tensions here as well. And Eric, you might explain to us all how the energy, the, the the AI solution that seems to consume so much energy is, you know, when we're going to have resolved that contradiction. Uh, so it'd be good to hear that. But on then, Prime Minister, perhaps we can hear your, your concluding thoughts. Uh, we saw this huge statement of intent of over 20 billion, I think, invested in carbon capture. How far and how fast are you willing to go so that the UK really leads the world in the green transition? And importantly for everyone in the room, how do you want investors to think about their obligations here and their opportunities? But how can we do it in an energy efficient way? Just briefly, um, the demand for energy for data centers is massive. We need you to approve the necessary steps to make these data centers in Britain because your research scientists, your companies, your citizens all need these things. Now, how can I be in favor of green energy and also in favor of using more electric power? Because the more electric power allows us to build new materials, new science, eventually get fusion, which is the ultimate solution to these problems, and so forth. Just an improvement in energy efficiency through new materials in cars and distribution networks and so forth has a huge, huge impact. DeepMind here. Uh, did a test on data centers where with a small algorithmic change using their algorithm, which is called reinforcement learning, they improved performance by 15%. If, the, if you had a 15% improvement in energy efficiency in the distribution in Britain, think of the amount of additional capital that, that would free up for further investment. So it's paradoxical. Invest in AI, and as a result, the solutions to the energy transition become apparent much quicker. This is so important because um, we are absolutely committed to clean power by 2030, which is really tough. It's, it's the most exacting anywhere in the world in terms of getting to clean power. Um, it's tough, but it's doable. And what it brings with it is security, because yeah. I spoke about the ever-increasingly volatile world, um, which has caused great fluctuation in energy prices, which has borne born down on families and businesses alike in recent years. It gives us energy. Um, security, independence, lower energy bills, and obviously locks up lots of jobs of the future with it. So we're determined to do it for all those reasons. 
there, I mean, on the face of it, there is an apparent tension between AI and technology, which is massively going to increase the demand for energy, um, and this, you know, absolutely running towards clean power 2030. I actually think that if you step back, the two go together. Mm. In other words, what you need for your development, your AI, is more energy, but clean, reliable, cheaper energy, homegrown, is the answer to that conundrum. And actually, if we get this right, becomes an incredibly important selling point of the UK in terms of why would you want to put your databases here? Why would you want to develop AI here? Answer, because alongside our commitment to growth and technology is our commitment to a cheaper, more effective, um, more independent, more security energy source, which we can rump up at scales. And so on the face of it, there's a tension, but I actually think if we're smart about this, we can turn that apparent tension into a massive advantage. But it just goes back to where I started. We have got to be mission driven. We've got to have absolute clarity of purpose because you know, there are always sidewinds in government. This happens all the time. There's this argument, that argument. And you know, uh, staying steady to the course of purpose and mission is crucial in this. Well, that was our last question. I think I'm going to be allowed just one from Margarita from Vodafone to, to, to finish us up. It is all about growth, uh, and we think the answer to every question is AI, but it's actually about people. Margarita. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. And actually, I wanted to build on the conversation uh, on AI, because I'm sure you are acutely aware that most companies around us are wrestling with how do, I, do they accelerate AI adoption against a range of challenges, energy uh, and digital infrastructure being there, but also access to talent. So, specifically on talent, a uh, two-part question. To Eric, when you are not a company that develops AI, how can you actually be attractive for AI talent? And to the Prime Minister, we have just mentioned how the UK starts off in this race in a very good position with strong AI centers of excellence, but it's tough competition, so when you look beyond today, how do you plan to make the various strengths that the UK can put together uh, to sustain leadership on AI talent? Thank you. Well, l let me take the second question first, because I think, look, we do start in a very good position at the moment, um, you know, in the top three in the world when it comes to AI, mm -hmm. with, you know, that, that prize, Nobel Prize, um, to Demis is really significant in terms, I mean, you know, not the whole sector here um, has put us in a, in a fantastic place. Our universities, academic institutions um, are, you know, world leading, uh, a much overused phrase in politics, but true when it comes to our universities. We need to make sure we've got the right talent here um, available um, and, you know, that that is also there for business and investors. But we also need a real clear statement of intent. This matters, uh, and for that reason, we're going to go with this rather than um, allow um, anyone to sort of relinquish the advantage that we have um, in the starting position that we're in. So all of those are important, um, and that matters to us as a government, but I think uh, it matters equally to every business, every investor in the room, um, because this is going to be a real game changer over the next five to ten years. Um, and we have to be at the front of this race. If we, if we become spectators, others will run past us, and we cannot allow that to happen. The um, pro-growth agenda would start with high skills immigration, which is now in place here and should be expanded. Um, the current uh, problem in sh in is very, very real, what you're talking about. It's also temporary because the market signal in terms of education and so forth, all sorts of incredibly smart people are now getting graduate degrees in AI. And, and the key thing to do is to get them to either stay in Britain or come from Europe into Britain to do so. And I think that will solve it. In the very short term, the answer is probably working with some of the incumbents. But the real answer is just more talent. When this stuff is hard, it's complicated, it's being, it's being built now, it's bespoke. Sometimes it doesn't make sense to me and I have a PhD in the area. So uh, give it a little bit of time with the right leadership on your part. Britain can have all those people. They, they love working, they love living here. 
So AI and human beings together can be great growth drivers. Business and government together hopefully are going to be very ambitious and successful growth drivers. It's a wonderful day for us all to be thinking about betting big on Britain. Eric, Prime Minister, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, hello. Uh, yes, I can see everybody moving about. We are now going to have a brief refreshment break uh, and we will come back promptly, please, at 11.20 for a fantastic panel convened by our Secretary for State for Culture, Media and the Sports. Please come back at 11.20. We'll see you then. Thank you.